Excellent. Welcome to the Metasploit demo meeting. Spring is in full swing here in Austin. We're getting a lot of rain. Allergens are in the air. Good times. It's pretty usual for around here. So let's hop in. We have quite a few modules this time around, including lots of code execution. Uh, a few new modules on the Ruby uh, of the Ruby on Rails double tap ilk have been added to framework. Community contributor Carl Brainerd submitted a gather ox module, which exploits a path traversal vulnerability in Ruby on Rails path resolver versions up to and including 5.2.2, allowing you to read files on a vulnerable target. And targeting that same batch of Ruby on Rails versions comes a module from our own Wei Chen, which targets a vulnerability of the development mode, allowing an application's secret key base to be determined and then used to sign your payload code for execution on the target. Pretty cool. Yes. Um, from your community contributor IDE OX90 comes a module targeting many versions of WinRAR, which is anything through release 5.6.1 exploiting a form input validation vulnerability to gain remote code execution on the target. Specifically, it works by exploiting a path traversal vulnerability in WinRAR and then extracting ACE format files. And this module crafts an ACE file that will cause, cause vulnerable versions of WinRAR to extract the executable payload into the tar when target Windows user's profile, such that the payload automatically runs the next time the user logs in. Unique. Community contributor Fabio Cogno hooked us up with a module for exploiting a PHP deserialization vulnerability in PIM core web app software. Authentication is required, but this exploit affects all software versions prior to 5.7.1 and will get you remote code execution on the target. From community member POW1 comes a module targeting a SQL injection vuln in certain versions of ESEL software from AIS, which is Advanced Info Data Systems, a logistics software company based in Germany, leading to unauthenticated remote code execution. I like that. Community member Aringo provided modules for achieving persistence on targets which use apt and yum package managers like, you know, Debian and Red Hat distros and, and those related to those distros. These modules require an existing session on the target and will utilize the pre invoke hook mechanism for apt using targets or the plugin mechanism for yum using targets, setting up the specified payload to be executed whenever apt get update or yum update is run on the target. And uh, we'll have a demo of this. Uh, last meeting, we mentioned and demoed a uh, module from community contributor Rock Groove, which uh, achieves unauthenticated remote code execution via velocity template injection bone in Confluence's widget connector macro. Uh, in fact, Aaron demoed that for us last time. Uh, it's listed here again this time around because last time it narrowly missed the framework cutoff release by literally just a few minutes. So Thanks for rubbing it in, by the way. You know, yeah. I just, I just, I felt bad. You know? <laughs> you gotta get faster. You gotta get faster. Yeah. This is also a gentle, <laughs> tough. a gentle poke. <laughs> 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 only kidding, only kidding. Yeah, it's so a little bit of shame. It's, li it's listed here really just as a reminder to let people know that it is, it is in the framework releases now, uh, so have that. And there's more. Contributor B. Coles provided a local priv privesque module for an older vulnerability, one that you might find in Red Hat Enterprise Linux releases four through six, or Fedora releases 12 through 14 inclusive. This module targets the stat run executable that's part of system tap version 1.3, manipulating its use of mod probe mod probe options to get you a session as root. It's kind of nice. And contributor Zero Steiner submitted a scanner module for detecting general packet radio service or GPRS servers by sending GPRS tunneling protocol or GTP echo request packets and looking for echo reply responses. And rounding out our module list today is a new module from Committer root up targeting vulnerable versions of the Spring Cloud config server software, which allows unauthenticated directory traversal to access files on the target. Good stuff. Big list this week. A strong list too. It's very, it's really strong. Yeah, a lot of really interesting stuff. And there's been some work outside of modules. Community contributor B. Coles took some time to update five existing modules, including updating the tested target versions, updating documentation, making code improvements. Much appreciate that. Community contributor Zero Steiner helped improve MFS consoles tab completion when spaces are involved, acting in a more user intuitive fashion now when you're tab completing like a file name or a payload or something that has spaces in it, which is great. Speaking of tab completion, our own Will Vu improved the time it takes for calculating compatible payloads for a module, which means if you tab complete for an available payload, you'll get your list of available payloads quicker. It's awesome. Will also updated the MSF console info command to include more module details, including related modules, and in cases where there's not an associated CVE, why there isn't an associated CVE. That's awesome. Yeah, makes it, makes it more, more useful. Community contributor Hoodie improved the identification ability of the password hash identifier library code and framework, allowing it to now identify more hashes of different types. Super cool. 
And Hoodie also updated the password prompt spoof post module for Mac OS to store any credential it does gather as loot in the database, which makes sense. That's great. And our own Jacob Robles took some time to generalize mix in code for Nuo targets, placing it in Rex, and also updating our existing framework modules that target Nuo software and devices to use, use that mix in code. Super cool. And bug fixes, we have a few bug fixes. Uh, community member CFP rules provided a fix for the check method of the Apache range header DOS module, which avoids a crash, like that. Our own Matthew Kino provided some fixes related to notes, bones, and git service RPC commands when interacting with the framework database. And our own Adam Kamek spotted that a Jenkins job for generating the framework modules made it metadata JSON file had gone off and committed an empty file of JSON metadata instead of the usual multiple megabytes of JSON metadata. Turns out the way we were handling the URL reference in one of our newer modules was the culprit, which Adam fixed by URL encoding that string. And he also added logic to make sure we're not bit by this again in the future. Appreciate that. You can read all the details in the weekly Metasploit wrap-up blog post at blog.rapid7.com. And as always, a huge thanks to all who helped make Metasploit better through their contributions. There's our emoji we like to use for thank you, I think, for some of us anyway. So thank you, appreciate that. And with that, let's have some demos. Now this, is, this, this is actually, I'm gonna preface this. This one is actually a hot off the presses demo of a module which was landed yesterday. Uh, so it didn't get cut into the release, but it's available. Rub it in again, you get have Repo Master, no, man. This is, <laughs> you see, this is you know, Aaron's got Aaron's got the cutting edge stuff. And the, so. the one, who, the person who contributed this is a community member named um, Andres, who featured in the JSO research because of their previous contributions. So good stuff from the community here. Yeah, super cool. Thanks for collaborating on that, Aaron and Will. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, this has been a, a, an amazing contributor. Um, as Caitlin said, we've highlighted uh, his work on a few occasions, but this is yet another example of that. Um, so this is one we've been going back and forth on, and uh, both Will Lou and I have been providing some input uh, to help kind of strengthen this. But to give you a quick walkthrough, uh, I'll start by highlighting a little bit of uh, what Will Lou had worked on. Uh, we demoed at the last meeting. Uh, if you use, uh, say, use web logic. You notice we've kind of started to build up quite a, a collection of web logic uh, exploits at this point, targeting different versions. But in this case, uh, this is against uh, some newer versions, and this is the one we'll be highlighting here is uh, the async response uh, uh, vulnerability. And so this is, um, I'll do info here. Uh, this is targeting uh, a this this endpoint called async response service. And so it's, uh, it's very similar to some of the exploits we've had in the past, but uh, the important difference is that the, some of the earlier stuff, uh, for instance, the paper that uh, we published a little bit ago was on Java deserialization vulnerabilities. This is actually an XML deserialization vulnerability. So neighboring uh, class of vulnerability, but slightly different. Um, fundamentally, still very similar in that they're uh, extremely reliable uh, mechanisms to get on a, on a host. So as a quick little demo here, uh, we'll go ahead and target a uh, Ubuntu Linux box that's just sitting over here. This is a stock Ubuntu Linux box and uh, just web logic with default settings um, sitting here running. So uh, one of the things that we added recently is a check. So it's possible to do a benign check of the target uh, just to make sure that endpoint exists. Uh, that's and I'm not going to put it in a, in a potentially vulnerable state. Uh, since this is a Linux target, um, we have uh, by default the uh, exploit target set to Linux but the exploit itself does also target Unix and uh, uh, Solaris, or excuse me, Windows and Solaris as well. Um, so on a, on a Linux environment, it's, uh, it's easy to you know, immediately get a command prompt on here. Uh, the downside to where it is right now, and possibly an area for some future work, is that if you wanted to go ahead and upgrade that to a interpreter session, we have, of course, the shell to interpreter, um, shell to interpreter, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, module that we can go in and we can set session to one. Uh, excuse me, I'm actually set session to six. I didn't realize how old this thing was. Um, and so that'll go ahead and upgrade us to a uh, interpreter session. Uh, and so now we have a command shell and a uh, interpreter environment running on that box. Uh, just by way of demonstrating, if we fall back to two, <sighs> If we fall back to the the, uh, the module we're demoing here once more, uh, just to give a quick demo of what it would look like in a Windows environment, I actually have a newer version of WebLogic here 
uh, that would not be vulnerable. So this was just part of our testing to make sure that this did not uh, fail in any, any particularly bad ways. So we can go ahead and set our host to our Windows target. Uh, our check, you'll notice, is OS agnostic. So we can confirm that the target is vulnerable or not without having to use a, uh, without having to specify the payload here. Uh, but then if we go ahead and, you know, even against uh, good uh, judgment, go ahead and throw the exploit, uh, you'll see that it fails and it, it, uh, we do our, our checking to make sure that we do get a, a valid uh, HTTP response code. So we get a little bit of error back there. It doesn't put the target in a vulnerable state. So this is actually a, a pretty reliable, handy exploit in terms of, um, both having a, a good check, supporting multiple operating systems, being fairly reliable, and not uh, potentially putting the target in an unstable way. Super cool. Yeah. Any, uh, any questions for Aaron? Going once. Okay. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Aaron. Sure thing. All right, uh, let's see. I'll grab the share back and attempt to. Thoughts on me. All right. Uh, I'm going to demo the persistence via package manager uh, targeting an Ubuntu 18.04 system. So what we have here, my top terminal is just a uh, Mesplot console session that already has an exist, sorry, Mesplot console prompt with the already existing session to my target, which is down here. Like I said, it's just straight up Ubuntu 18.04. And what this is going to do is, is we're going to use the new module from Oringo that allows us to install a pre-invoke hook in the apt, uh, apt hooks. So I already have a handler set up for accepting incoming sessions. So we'll select the, select the correct module. And I've got my pre-cooked commands here because I'm lazy and really don't want to try to remember all this. So session one is our interpreter session that we have existing. We also have the being set the payload. So yeah, we want it to, to use a 64-bit interpreter uh, is what we want to persist on the target. And we'll just set up our host and port just so it knows where to call back to. And it is as simple as that. So when we run this, it's going to use the existing session to install the pre-invoke hook on our target, well, that's the goal anyway. So it says, okay, I'm attempting to write the hook. So it even tells you, okay, I wrote the hook on the target here via the existing session we had. So let's take a look. Does this file really exist? Hey, look, it does. What, is the, what are the contents of this file? Well, it basically says here's an apt uh, pre-invoke hook, and this is the executable that it also created of our payload. So we do a file of that. That looks pretty reasonable, 64-bit payload. Okay, so we have this running now. If things worked, it says it even tells you right here that you know, where, where it had uploaded that file, and that is exactly where we saw it over here. And uh, it says the backdoor will run on the next, next apt update. So let's do a quick sanity check of sessions. We only have one session. So unsuspecting user over here says, you know, app get update. And you do it when you do this as a, as a non privileged user, you get this. This is a typical error. It's like, oh, yeah, I got to run this as root. So, sudo. And if things worked, we see that we got an, an, another session up here now. Yeah. yeah. And so, the nice thing about this is this will, this will this persist across reboots. It's there anytime anybody does an app get update. The, the corollary to this one uh, works for YUM also in Red Hat and Red Hat derived uh, distros. Uh, so, this is like, very nice little way to just kind of keep them shells that pop under you want, you know, like, like those things. And since those are usually scheduled tasks, like that's just good. Well, that's just it, right? Keep you shells know, rolling out. On the regular, you know, just kind yeah. of keep, keep it coming in. As somebody made the joke about the aptitude package manager becoming, like the APT becoming the advanced persistence. Surely, Yes, that is pretty good. Yeah. So is this, yeah. is this patch in, in, in that supporting APT and YAM, or is that just not? Yeah. As far as I know, there's, there's there's been no attempt to try to try to mitigate this. Yeah. Well. Um, so. Fun fact: the uh, contributor who who contributed this um, and the other persistence module is actually giving a talk at Nolicon in a week and a half about mm -hmm. their experience getting into open source development and in particular working with Metasploit. So, good luck to them on that. That's awesome. 
Mm -hmm. so, cool. I see if we keep re rerun the command here, we keep getting, you know, just keep getting <laughs> sessions. <laughs> 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 yeah, so, like, to, chef controlled or anything like that. Well, that's just it, right? Exactly. Like, it dovetails in with like what Aaron was saying. If you, if you have some some cron job or chef you know, type of work going, that it's you can just have these. Oh, oh, Are we going to get way too many sessions? Denial of service. Excellent.